How y'all doing today? Everybody doing okay? All right. Good to see you all. My name is Devin. Uh, it's, it's great to be back. I was out of town for a little bit, but it's good to be back. So thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we got a few people still kind of kind of roaming in here. So while we do that, um, we're going to go ahead and we're going to stand. We're going to start off the service with some music today and love to hear you guys sing as loud as possible. So let's let's get going. Remember those walls that we call sin and shame. They were like prisons that we couldn't escape. But he came and he died and he rose. Those walls are rubble now. Remember those giants we call death and grave. They were like mountains that stood in our way. But he came and he died and he rose. Those giants are dead now. Cause this is our God. This is who he is. He loves us. This is our God. This is what he does. He saves us. He bore the cross and beat the grave. Let heaven and earth proclaim this is our God, King Jesus. Remember that fear that took our breath away. Faith so weak that we could barely pray. But he heard every word. Every whisper. Now those altars in the wilderness tell the story of his faithfulness. Never once did he fail, and he never will. Cause this is our God, this is who he is. Nobody but Jesus who pulled me out of that pit. He did, he did, who paid for all of our sin. Nobody but Jesus who rescued me from that grave. Yahweh, Yahweh, who gets the glory and praise. Nobody but Jesus who rescued me from that grave.
tells the sun to rise every morning, colors the sky with the shades of his glory, wakes us with mercy and love, Jesus does. Who holds the orphan, comforts the widow, cries for injustice, feels every sorrow, carries the pain of his children, Jesus does. play a song called uh, Death Was Arrested, and I was talking to Brian this week a little bit about <clears throat> the, what the service was about, and uh, and he said, you know, and I don't want to give, I'm not going to give it away, not, no spoilers, no spoilers, but uh, what, what, I, what is so cool about um, grace, you know, like I was thinking about it, you know, and, and we're in summertime, and I've got three kids, and they're wonderful kids, don't get me wrong, I love them very much. But kids require some attention, and they require uh, some time. And I have a, a little guy, Remy, who's uh, six years old. He loves to play baseball. Gosh. If he could play baseball every minute of the day, I think he would. But he doesn't like to do it by himself. He likes to do it with me uh, or with his big brother. And so what I realize is during school, you know, I rely on, on the school to give me a break. I rely on the school to teach my kids, but also to give me a little time without the kids. And during the summer, it requires me to provide a little bit more grace than normal. And during the summer, because you're, you know, you're, you're with your kids, and I, I really do cherish the moments that I get to spend with my kids a way, way more. And I know by the end of the summer, everyone's a little exhausted. You're a little tired. 
you're a little worn out. But you know what's really cool about uh, that time in the summer is the fact that you, your kids were able to receive all this extra grace from you. We go to bed later. We let, them, we let them do way more things in the summer than we let them do during the school year. So what, what I realize is that there are times when I'm, I, I give more grace than others. There are times when I'm more strict than I am for others. And, that, and that's all fine and good. And there's time and place for those rules and for, and for all that. But what it made me think about was the fact that no matter what, God has rules for us. He has things that he knows what's best for us. But no matter what we do in this life, no matter what we do throughout Every moment of our life, it is unlimited grace for us, and it has nothing to do with the things that we've done. And that's what is so funny about kids, too, is like, you know, a lot of times we say you earned, you earned something. You earned more time on the iPad, or you earned more time to do what you wanted to do. And that's not the case for us in our salvation. There is no earning. There is no earning. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't try to do the best you can. Do, do the best. Love others. Be filled with grace. Be the character of God. But that has nothing to do with the grace that he gives us each and every day. And so we're going to play this song called Death Was Arrested. And it just says, oh, your grace so free washes over me. You make me new. And now my life begins with you. So let's all sing this together and think about the grace that we are given daily that is so free and so abundant. that We take it for granted all the time. But let's sing this one together. My sorrow and dead in my sin, lost without hope, no place to begin. Your love made a way to let mercy come in when death was arrested. was redeemed, only beauty remains. And my orphan heart was given a name. And my morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested, my life began. Oh, your grace so free washes over me. You have made me new now. Life begins with you. Released from my chains, I'm a prisoner no more. Shame was a ransom faithfully born. He canceled my debt and he called me his friend. When death was arrested and my life began, sing it out, oh your grace, oh your grace. Oh, is over me. You have made me new now. Life begins with you. It's your endless love pouring down on us. You have made us new now. Life begins with displayed on a criminal's cross. Darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost. But then Jesus arose with our freedom in hand. That's when death was arrested. Is over 
Amen. All right. You guys sound great this morning. Thanks for singing along. You guys can go ahead and have a seat. And I'm going to go ahead and uh, say goodbye to our kiddos this morning. You guys are awesome as always. Thank you guys for lighting up the room. We love it very much. So if you are in the uh, preschool age, I would love for you guys to line up over here. Is that right, Christina? Over here on this side. Preschool age or, yeah, who we got? Who we got? I see Luke. Luke's going. All right, preschool age on that side. Elementary age right over here with Miss Cindy. All right. And then 45, fourth and fifth grade, you guys can head out to the Vibe Building. You guys are awesome. Thank you so much for being so respectful and dishonest with us right now because I know you're not always like that. All right, we got some announcements for you guys. Good morning, good morning. I always wonder, because like, I record some videos every now and then, I always want to know, how many takes does that take? Because like, if I do a two-minute video, it takes like eight, nine, ten tries to get it right. So my name is Brian. I'm the pastor here at Crossroads. Thank you so much for joining us. I want you guys to take just like three or four minutes to meet someone, greet someone, say hi to someone you didn't get a chance to say hi to before service. Do that right now. Say hi, high five, handshake, hug, whatever. All right, ready, go.
All right, everyone, let's make our way back to our seats, please. Make our way back to our seats. Thank you so much. All right. If you have your Bibles, if you have your Bibles, I'm going to ask you to turn to Genesis 12. We're going to start back in Genesis, in Genesis 12, because Paul, the guy who wrote the letter to the Romans, to the Roman church, he talks a lot about a guy named Abraham in Romans chapter 4. So if we don't go back to Genesis and you're not church familiar, you're going to be super lost. So um, I wanted to make sure we go back and look at uh, just some highlights from Abram. Starts as Abram, later becomes Abraham, his life, uh, because I never want uh, to assume that people have certain or specific biblical understandings. When I first started going to church, uh, the first when I first started going to church, I'd never opened the Bible. I'd never read the Word of God before. I didn't even like my family didn't own a Bible. I think we may have had like this big giant King James one in the basement somewhere for some reason, but it never got opened. It had more dust on it than it had been opened. Um, and so when we go to church, you know, I'd be like, "Turn to Genesis." I'd be like, "Table of contents, it is awesome." Um, fun fact, I still do that in the Minor Prophets in the Old Testament, because I never remember which one goes in what order. So, um, never feel bad if you are like, oh, I don't know where that is, or you're a, if you're a bit confused about something, please don't hesitate to ask me or someone near you. Um, no one is going to make fun of you or anything like that when it comes to what you do and don't understand about the Bible. We are all in different stages in this journey of faith, in this journey of following Jesus. So Genesis 12 is where we're going to begin. So I'm going to pray, and then we will jump right in. God, this morning, thank you for your grace that is so full. God, your grace that the Bible calls sufficient. God, where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. Thank you for that this morning. Thank you that we can stand freely, justified, made right before you this morning. For those of us who have said yes to you and believe in you and your son and your resurrection, that we are counted as righteous, and we'll see that this morning. God, as we talk about your grace and we talk about faith, I pray that your spirit moves in the hearts of people this morning, those that are far away from you, can begin making their way back towards you. Those who have never found you, may they find you this morning. And may they be given the gift of faith. May they believe in you and trust in you and accept you at your word. This morning, give us ears that are ready to hear, hearts that are ready to be molded, and feet that are ready to be moved into action. If you've got anything that I say that's from me in my imagination, let it be forgotten before anyone leaves this room or logs off this video, but everything that's from you, let it stick forever. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Genesis 12. This is where we're introduced to a guy named Abram, later becomes Abraham, his wife Sarai, who later becomes Sarah. God is in the business of changing names, starting in verse 1. Uh, just so you guys know, I'm reading from the New Living Translation recently, really been loving it, um, talking to some people who are newer to our church. They love the New Living Translation, so we're going to stick with that for a little bit. You know me, I get bored pretty quickly, so we'll change it in a few months. It's fine. Genesis chapter 12. The Lord said to Abraham, said to Abram, sorry if I could read, leave your native country, your relatives, and your father's family, essentially everything you've ever known or ever have been exposed to. I want you to leave it all behind. And go to the land that I will show you. That's one of my favorite verses in all the Bible. I'm gonna, I want you to go. Well, where? I want you to go. Left or right, I want you to go, and when you go, just go, and then eventually I'll show you where that going leads you, and that is, I'm sorry, how it works following God. <laughs> if you follow God for any length of time, you know that's how it works. I really would like at least step one. Step two would be awesome, 
And he says, okay, follow me. Mm, how about which direction am I following you? Just follow me. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. Verse 2. You'll notice as we look in Abram's story, the phrase, I will, God speaking, happens a lot. It says, I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families of the earth will be blessed through you. That's important. We've got to remember that. All the families of the earth will be blessed through Abram. So Abram departed as the Lord had instructed, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he left Haran. Now, go a little bit farther into Genesis, Genesis 15. So Abram has been called by God, given some promises, and he follows obediently to start with. That's huge. It's amazing. Given very little instructions, but he follows along. Genesis 15, starting in verse 1. It says, Some time later, the Lord spoke to Abram in a vision and said to him, Do not be afraid, Abram, for I will protect you, and your reward will be great. But Abram replied, O sovereign Lord, what good are all your blessings when I don't even have a son? He says, How can he be the father of many nations if he has no children? And in that culture, it wasn't just about having children, it was about having sons. And real quick, in the New Testament, when it says, you are now sons of God, and so many New Testament translations change that to children of God, that loses its meaning in the, in the cultural context, because sons got the inheritance. Sons had privilege. Sons had rights. Sorry, ladies, they didn't back then. Now we change it to children to be gender inclusive, which is wonderful. I love that. But when we do that, we miss something, that we're sons, we're heirs, we're given what the father has. And so Abram is saying, I don't, your blessings are cool. I like your promises, but I don't have any sons. He says, since you've given me no children, Eleazar of Damascus, a servant in my household, will inherit my wealth. You have given me no descendants of my own, so one of my servants will be my heir. Then the Lord said to him, no, your servant will not be your heir, for you will have a son of your own who will be your heir. Then the Lord took Abram outside and said to him, look up to the sky and count the stars if you can. I always think Abram actually started to do that. I do. Because I believe he had this like ridiculous childlike faith because God said go and he said, okay. He says, come outside and met, count the stars. Okay. Like I'm just metaphorically, that's a lot. Okay. And he says, that's how many descendants you will have. God meets Abram and gives him a physical demonstration of the promise. And here's verse 6, which is huge. We have to remember this for the rest of the message. And Abram believed the Lord, and the Lord counted him as righteous because of his faith. Now, this is really early in Jewish faith. In fact, pre-law, before the Levitical law, before Exodus and Moses and all of that happened. This is way before that. And we have this moment where when given a promise, Abram believes and trusts God at his word. He takes God at his word, and that is counted to him as righteousness. We jump down to verse 9. Here's this weird moment, but it's amazing. He said, the Lord told him, him being Abram, bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. So Abram presented all of these and killed them. Then he cut each animal down the middle and laid halves side by side. He did not, however, cut the birds in half. Now, that sounds super weird, right? It's not something that happens in our everyday life. It's not that God calls us to do that and we live, you know, half a cow here and half a cow here. But in this context, something amazing is about to happen. When two people would make a promise to each other, when they would make a covenant to each other, what they would do is they would call it cutting the covenant. And so they would take an animal and they would sacrifice it before God or before whatever deity they believed in, and they would, they would put one half over here and one half over there. And then together they would walk between these cut halves, essentially saying, if I break the covenant, may what happened to them happen to me. It's a cultural thing. It happened all the time. And so this is what God says. And then we jump down to verse 17 because this is where it's absolutely amazing here. Genesis 15, 17. After the sun went down and darkness fell, 
Abraham, Abram saw a smoking pot, fire pot and flaming torch pass between the halves of the carcasses. If we go forward to Exodus, when they are led by God, they are led by a pillar of smoke and a pillar of fire. These are representative of the spirit and presence of God. Now watch what happens. They go between the halves of the carcasses. Notice Abram doesn't. Abram doesn't go between the carcasses. God's presence and power does. Because only God can make a covenant with someone. No one can make a covenant with God. Okay? God is the covenant maker. I can't covenant before God. Like I, In marriage, we covenant before God, but that's not a covenant with God. God is the one who covenants with us, promises us. We can promise him all day long. He's like, you're cute. Thanks. That's sweet. So Abram sits, and God's presence goes between these carcasses, telling Abram, if I break my promise, it would happen to these animals, happen to me. Which, fun fact, he doesn't break his promise, and it still happens to him. The crucifixion, the resurrection, it's amazing, absolutely amazing. And then verse 18, just the beginning. So the Lord made a covenant with Abram that day and said, I have given this land to your descendants, and on and on he goes. So we go to uh, chapter 17, okay? So Abram's been called. Abram's been promised. The covenant has been made. All of those things have happened, okay? Now we get to chapter 17, where another unique, interesting, somewhat uh, not fun to talk about in church we're going to jump in. The Mark of the Covenant. If you know church, here we go. 17 verse 9. Then Mark, then not Mark. It says the Mark above it. Then God said to Abram, Abraham now, your responsibility is to obey the terms of the covenant. You and all your descendants have this continual responsibility. This is the covenant that you and your descendants must, must keep. Each male among you must be circumcised. You must cut off the flesh of the foreskin as a sign of the covenant between me and you. From generation to generation, every male must be circumcised on the eighth day after his birth. Jesus was, we see it in Luke. This applies not only to members of your family, but also to your servants born in your household and the foreign-born servants whom you have purchased. All must be circumcised. Your bodies will bear the mark of my everlasting covenant. Any male who fails to be circumcised will be cut off from the covenant family for breaking the covenant. This is a physical, outward expression. Now, again, I'm not God. I don't know why he chose this to be the outward sign. I don't know if we're showing it off too often to make sure. Maybe they were. I don't know. Maybe that was part of, hey, nice to meet you. Are you covenanted? Yes, prove it. Okay, marvelous. We move on. Like, I don't know, but it would have been much more comfortable for me had we put, like, something on the back of our hand, you know? Like, but that's, I'm not God. This is why I think God's funny sometimes. He's like, let's, let's make this awkward for everybody. Let's, let's make this uncomfortable for thousands of years later for everyone talking about it. Yeah, let's do that. And so we have this moment. And if I, if, So now we're going to step into the recipients of Romans chapter 4. Okay? We're going to step in. Oh, sorry, I got one more. 15 through 17. 15 through 17. Forgot this one. Then God said to Abraham, regarding Sarah, Sarai, your wife, her name will no longer be Sarai. From now on, her name will be Sarah. And I will bless her and give you a son from her. Yes, I will bless her richly, and she will become the mother of many nations. Kings of nations will be among her descendants. Then Abraham bowed down to the ground, but he laughed to himself in disbelief. How could I become the father at the age of 100, he thought, and how can Sarah have a baby when she is 99 years old? She is 90 years old. Even back then, that's way past having baby age. Chapter 21, Isaac is born, son of promise. Genesis 22 is this amazing, weird moment where God says, all right, I need to see if Abraham truly trusts me and believes me. He says, okay, the son I've given you, I want you to give it back. I want you to sacrifice him. And Abraham's like, okay, fine, I, this is weird. But you're God, and I trust you. And so he goes to sacrifice him. God stops him and says, now I know you completely and totally trust me. You're going to give me the one thing that you've been waiting your whole life for. So now we're going to step into the recipients of Romans 4. We're going to put on this idea that we are Jewish people who have been taught our whole life that we are different. 
unique, special, have a special place and a special blessing with God because we are God's covenanted people. That Abraham is our father, and through circumcision and through the covenant, we are blessed by God, and we are unique among all the people in the world. Now, as we go through Romans 4, we're going to go verse by verse. It'll go quick, I promise. We'll read most of it. It's pretty self-explanatory. We're going to look at, uh, we're going to see that these, these two phrases or two ideas come up often. The first is faith and belief. Faith, belief, unbelief. In fact, Paul uses uh, faith, belief, unbelief over 60 times in this, in this letter. This is incredibly important for Paul to, un, to help us understand that in the new covenant, in the new law, in the grace that is extended to all people, it is based on faith. It is not based on adhering to the law, following the law, or believing that you have a special place with God because you're God's people. That's over. That's done. It is through faith. And the other one we're going to see over and over and over is counted, declared, and some of your translations will say reckoned. It's the idea to treat, to account, to reckon a person as something. It's to treat someone or see someone or give them something that is not inherent to them naturally. We're going to see that over and over. I think if I remember right, faith is in green. Count it as an orange as we go to Genesis, not Genesis, we're in Genesis, Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4, if you have your Bibles, let's turn there. It's only a 15-minute introduction, it's fine, here we go. You guys don't have lunch plans, it's fine. I'm kidding, this goes fast. This is one of those, chapter 4 almost preaches itself, it's so much fun. Romans 4, verse 1. Abraham was, humanly speaking, the founder of our Jewish nation. What did he discover about being made right with God? Now, that's a great question because to us Jews, as we're sitting here reading this, what made us right with God was the law and the sacrifices. I have the law of God. I have all the things I'm supposed to do, the yes, the no's, the do's, the don'ts, the shall's, the shall not's. I've got all those. And anytime I violate them, I have a list of things that I get to sacrifice to then be made right with God. Now, it wasn't actually making me right with God. It was like putting a Band-Aid on a bullet hole, but it's what they had. And it worked. And they worked it. And they understood it. And so if we're hearing this, again, this is a letter being read out loud for the first time. We read, what did he discover about being made right with God? And we immediately go, the law. The covenant. It was, it's as easy. That's an easy answer. Verse 2. If his good deeds following the law had made him acceptable to God, he would have had something to boast about. But that was not God's way. For the scriptures tell us Abraham believed God and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. Genesis 15, 6. This is amazing, amazing moment. And God said, your, your, heir, your servant is not going to be your heir. I'm going to give you a son. It's going to be awesome. I'm going to fulfill my promises. He takes him outside, number the stars, and he goes, okay, I'll try. That's how many descendants you'll have. And in that moment, based on, guys, like, he had no information. He had no Bible. He had no law. He had nothing written down. He just had these few interactions with this divine being, and he trusted him. And in that trust, God reckons him as righteous. He treats him as righteous, something not inherent to him before this moment. Verse 4. Now Paul makes a, a contradiction for us. He says, when people work, their wages are not a gift, but something you have earned. That's culturally relevant for every culture that's ever existed. You work, you get paid. It's that simple. Verse 5, but people are counted as righteous not because of their works, but because of their faith in God who forgives sinners. That is a startling claim, that last phrase, faith in God who forgives sinners. Because of this, I'm just going to put it up on the screen, Exodus 23 verse 7 tells us, 
Be sure never to charge anyone falsely with evil. Never sentence an innocent or blameless person to death, for I never declare a guilty person to be innocent. That's God speaking. I never do it. Which means you're not guilty. Because God can't contradict himself, right? If God is a perfect being, full of truth, having no lies, he cannot say, I will never declare a guilty person innocent and forgive sinners. He can't do both. Which means he's not forgiving sinners anymore. He's made us not guilty. He has given us, counted to us, his righteousness, his not guilty, and so he does not contradict himself. This is one of the most amazing claims in all of religion everywhere. That a God who has a list of laws, a God who is perfect and says, if I am perfect, you need to be perfect like me, and I've given you ways to be perfect, and every single one of you has violated at least one of them, probably this morning. But I'm not going to give to you what you deserve. I'm not going to give to you what you have earned. The wages of sin is death. I'm not going to give you that. I am the God who's going to take all of that on myself through becoming a human being. And instead, I'm going to treat you as if you've never sinned ever once before in your life. Nor will you ever sin again. That's how he can declare sinners not guilty. Because he found himself guilty. It's, the, the gospel is amazing. Amazing. Let me get to verse 6 in, in, back in Romans 4. So David, King David in the Old Testament, also spoke of this when he described the happiness of those who are declared righteous without working for it. Quoting from Psalm 32, he says, Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sins are put out of sight. Yes, what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of sin. The slate wiped clean. Though our sins are like crimson, we are made white as snow. This is a theme that you see repeatedly in church. And it's a theme that we hear so often it can lose, I'm going to use a term we don't like, it's magic. It's wonder. We hear this so often. We sing about it so often. It's preached so often. We read commentaries and Bible studies and book studies about this all the time. But it loses its full effect. That I stood guilty before a holy God. Having earned that guilt. Not by coercion, not by not knowing any better, by choice. And then through faith, I now stand before that same holy God, righteous and blameless. And if you have placed your faith in Jesus and said yes to that gift, so do you. We're not people who, who kind of stumble into the holy presence of God every now and then. We are righteous sons of God who walk with him daily. It's amazing. It's amazing. Verse 9. Here comes the question. So we're Jews sitting here going, yeah, that's great. God made us right with him. Awesome. Awesome. Paul says, now, is this blessing only for the Jew, or is it also, and I love this, for uncircumcised Gentiles? That's a curse word. Okay? Like, like uh, there's just no other way to say it. The, I've been thinking the only way we can, we can put this into context is he is essentially using the N-word. That's the same context it would have when he said uncircumcised Gentiles. And they're like, ew. Dirty, gross, nasty, out there, don't want to be a part of them, don't want to touch them. They're just awful people out there. Well, we've been saying that Abraham was counted as righteous by God because of his faith. I see where he's going, verse 10. But how did this happen? It's a mystery. 
Was he counted as righteous only after he was circumcised? Righteous in Genesis 15, circumcision in Genesis 17. Righteousness came before the circumcision. Or was it before he was circumcised? Clearly, God accepted Abraham before he was circumcised. Verse 11, circumcision was a sign that Abraham already had faith. And that God had already accepted him and declared him to be righteous even before he was circumcised. It's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. And the Jews, sorry, got it backwards for a really long time. We are circumcised to prove to everyone that we are God's people, essentially making us better. And then we follow the law because God loves us more than he loves other people and gave us the law. And we know we're not going to fulfill it, but he gave us sacrifices to make us right with him again because he loves us, not those dirty, uncircumcised Gentiles. And Paul is saying, that's all washed away, just like your sins. And we have this new thing, this new thing where everyone is right with him. And so it continues. So Abraham... is the spiritual father of those who have faith. Now, he could have just left it there. He could have just left it there and not ruffled feathers. But that's not Paul's way. Paul is not a middle-of-the-road preacher. He's not going to walk gently through the tulips to make sure he doesn't offend anyone. He says he's the father of everyone who has faith, but has not been circumcised. Like he, That's like yelling off the page to the Jewish hearers. Because only, the, only, only those who are circumcised are God's people. God's people, that's it. That's how it's been forever. That's how it's always been. That's how it's always going to be. We don't change things. And Paul's like, oh, everything has changed. What was up is down. What was left is right. Because God decided to come to earth. They are counted as righteous because of their faith. And he says this again in another letter in Galatians chapter 3, verses 6 and 7. We'll just put it on the screen. He says, in the same way, Abraham believed God and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. Genesis 15, 6. The real children, that's where it should be sons. The real sons of Abraham then are those who put their faith in God. The real people of God are not those who follow every jot and tittle of the law but those who place their faith in God, who take him at his word and believe that if he says, I have made you right, you have been made right. If he says that you have been made right only through Jesus, it is only through Jesus that that happens. Verse 12. He says, and Abraham is also the spiritual father of those who have been circumcised, but only if they have the same kind of faith Abraham did before he was circumcised. This is poking the bear, okay? He is beating this point because there's just no way for us to understand how difficult it would be for a Jewish Christian to hear this in the book of Acts. And you see it in the book of Acts, you see it over and over again, that there's this well, okay, well, God is doing things with the Gentiles, and he's giving them the, his spirit, and that's cool and all, but they should really stay over here, and we should stay over here. You even see this with Peter, who saw this firsthand. Peter, one of the original followers of Jesus, saw this firsthand when he went to a, a Gentile's house, and he's like, you know I'm not supposed to be here. Like, me even eating with you makes me unclean. And then the spirit descends on, on the Gentiles just like it did, and everyone... In, uh, in at Pentecost in the book of Acts, and <laughs> Peter's like, ah, uh, I, don't, I don't understand this. You are dirty, gross, nasty people. How did you dirty, gross, nasty people get the spirit of God that us good, wonderful Jewish people have? God must be doing something, and he's like, okay, great. But then the moment his Jewish friends come, Peter's like, I don't really know those Gentiles. Like, they do their own thing. We're over here. They have their food, and I have our food. And, like, we don't really interact. 
And Paul writes that he, he went to Peter and rebuked him in his face and said, what are you doing? There is no us in them. There is no Jew and Gentile. That's gone. The days of division are done. There is one new family. It still stands today in church. I know we got our Baptists, our Lutherans, our Methodists, our Quakers, our Shakers, our candlestick makers. Like we got every color of church you could ever want. And part of me loves that because it's different expressions of the same thing. And part of me is like, I don't know that that's the way it's supposed to be. Unless we're all still eating together at the same table, but we're not. I believe the division in God's church breaks God's heart. Whether it be here or abroad. Rant over, verse 13. Clearly... God's promise to give the whole earth to Abraham and his descendants was based not on his obedience to God's law because he didn't have it. God's law comes in Exodus, the whole book later, 400 plus years later. I'm just going by how long the Jews were in slavery. Longer than that. And they said, no, it wasn't based on his obedience. He couldn't be obedient to a law he didn't have. But on a right relationship with God that comes by faith. Verse 14, if God's promise is only for those who obey the law, then faith is not necessary. And the promise is pointless. For the law always brings punishment on those who try to obey it. Because the only way to avoid breaking the law is not to have a law to break. Because if someone gives me one rule, I'd probably be kind of okay with that. But if you give me two rules, I'm going to figure out how to break one of them. That is our human nature. That is how children function. That's how I function. That's how grandparents, like, we all function that way. There's this, like, just part of us that just hates rules and regulations. Even me, who's a general rule follower, you give me too many rules or a rule that doesn't make any sense, and I want to break it. And Paul says the law was there, and he says this over and over in other places. The law is given to prove our need for a Savior, to demonstrate to us you can't do this on your own. I've even given you all the steps on how to do it on your own, and you won't do it. Can't and won't. Verse 17. Oh, sorry, 16. So the promise is received by faith. It is given as a free gift. And we are all certain to receive it, whether or not we live according to the law of Moses. If we have faith like Abraham's, for Abraham is the father of all who believe. That is what the scriptures mean when God told him, I have made you the father of many nations. This happened because Abraham believed in the God who brings the dead back to life and who creates new things out of nothing. Now, we, as New Testament believers, we, we hear that and think Jesus, okay? The first Jewish hearers would not have thought that. They would have thought Genesis 17, 17, this moment when it says, Then Abraham bowed down to the ground, but he laughed at himself in disbelief. How could I become a father at the age of 100, and how can Sarah have a baby when she is 90 years old? That's what they would have thought. God brought to life something that wasn't available. She was barren. She could not have children. That's what the Jewish audience would have heard. We hear Jesus, and even the early followers of Jesus, being Jews, would have still thought Genesis 17. Verse 18. Even when there was no reason for hope, Abraham kept hoping, believing that he would become the father of many nations. For God had said to him, that's how many descendants you will have. And Abraham's faith did not weaken, even though at about 100 years of age, he figured his body was as good as dead. And so was Sarah's womb. Abraham never wavered in believing. I'm like, I'm going to pause there for just a second. I think that's Paul being really, really nice to Abraham. Like, if you read Genesis, like, Abraham didn't quite have the faith and patience that Paul is making it out to be here. In fact, um, they tried to circumvent the process. God promised a son. She can't have a son. Well, she's got this servant. Maybe we can have a baby that way. And then they did. And God's like, that's not what I done did. Told you. 
And Paul's like, that wasn't really unbelief. Okay, Paul, we can debate that. It's okay. But what he's doing is he's being a good pastor, and he's pointing out the highlights, okay? He's being a good preacher. He's pointing out the highlights of the belief, and don't waver in your belief, and have faith, and all those things. That's what he's doing. God's promise, in fact, sorry, Abraham never wavered in believing God's promise. In fact, his faith grew stronger, and in this, he brought glory to God. And that's what you see in Genesis 22 with the call to sacrifice his son. He believed in a way that you and I just might struggle to understand. He was fully convinced, fully convinced that God is able to do whatever he promises. And because of Abraham's faith, God counted him as righteous. And when God counted him as righteous, it wasn't just for Abraham's benefit. It was recorded for our benefit, assuring us that God will also count us as righteous if we believe in him, the one who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. And this is where Paul makes this turn from talking about history and past to talking about present. That all this happened as a demonstration, as an example for us sitting here today. Now, he was talking a couple thousand years ago. It's still the exact same message today. That when we have faith in Jesus for life, death, burial, and resurrection, of God in the flesh, Emmanuel, who took our sins upon him, the sins from the beginning of time to the end of time, and he took them on himself, absorbed them in his death, defeated them in his resurrection, and in in exchange for that, has given us the righteousness of God. What happened to Abraham, that his faith was counted, reckoned. Another way I've heard it put is it was um, deposited into his account. Those of us who maybe grew up poor or were were poor or currently are poor, depositing money in our account, we're like, ooh, I get that. I don't have, and now I do. And that's what Paul's saying. And what's crazy to me is this was always there. The Jews who love the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, this was always there. Genesis 17, 5. What's more? I'm changing your name. It will no longer be Abram. Instead, you'll be called Abraham, for you will be the father of many nations. Not just the Jewish nation. Many nations. In today's world, not just our nation, but all nations. He is the God of all nations. And everyone, in every nation, every tribe, every color, who places their faith in Jesus is a son of Abraham. And we still have this idea of circumcision in the New Testament. It's just no longer a physical thing. Uh, Just for time, Colossians 2, verse 11. When you come to Christ, you were circumcised, but not by a physical procedure. Christ performed a spiritual circumcision, the cutting away of your sinful nature. No longer do we have to go through this awkward, uncomfortable ceremony. Now we have this moment where we can stand before God, right with him, because he has circumcised, he has cut away the part of us that is unnecessary, the sinful nature. And again, Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. And now you Gentiles have also heard the truth, that good, the good news that God saves you. And when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit. That is the sign of the covenant, whom he promised long ago. Verse 14. The Spirit is God's guarantee that he will give us the inheritance he promised and that he has purchased us to be his own people. He did this so we would praise and glorify him. So in Pentecost, when the Spirit comes, when we are filled with the Spirit of God, that is the mark of the new covenant that we'll celebrate here in just a little bit with our communion, that the blood that was shed on the cross is the blood of the new covenant that is sealed with the Holy Spirit. And back to verse 24 real quick of Romans 3. It says, for our benefit too, assuring us that God will also count us righteous, and here it is, if We believe. That's what it all boils down to. That is the baseline, fundamental, foundational thing. We can hear this all day long. We can be taught from the time we could walk, before we could walk, before we could talk, until today. We could be taught this all the time. We could have been drugged to church four or five times a week. We could be in Awana and VBS and Bible studies. And we go to men's study. And we go to this. And we go to that. And we do all the things. And it can mean absolutely nothing. If there's not faith. 
because if it's not faith, all you're doing is working for a wage that you can't earn. By faith, if we believe, you have to choose to believe it. And verse 25 is what we believe in. He was handed over to die because of our sins and was raised to life to make us right with God. I love when Paul simplifies the gospel into a sentence. I'm spending years in seminary studying this, and Paul's like, I got you in one sentence, bro. He was handed over to die because of our sins, and he was raised to life to make us right with God. Wonderful. Have faith. Believe that. Because that's what it's been from the beginning. This isn't a new revelation of God. This is a very old revelation of God forgotten throughout Jewish history. But Paul's like, we missed it, gentlemen and ladies. We've missed it. It is through faith. And here in just a moment, we're going to celebrate that. I love that this is where Romans 4 stops. Because that's what communion is. Communion is us celebrating the gift of salvation, the exchange of sin for righteousness. And when we break the bread, when we, when we break the loaf, don't ever lose what that means. Don't ever think it's just a cute little symbol that our God became us, feeling all the pain that we feel. And his body was broken for us. When we take the cup, never think of it as just juice, or if you go to another church, just wine. Never think of it as just anything. If our Catholic brothers and sisters believe that in some, I'm going to call it weird way, sorry, my former Catholic people, we're Catholic now, in this unique way, that that actually physically becomes the body and blood of Jesus. If our Catholic brothers and sisters believe that, we can't minimize <laughs> what this means. Don't ever think of it as just a loaf or just a cup. This is the fulfillment of the entirety of Scripture. This is the promise that's given to us that when received by faith, allows us to stand rightly before our God. That's why this summer, as we go through Romans, as Paul talks about this week in and week out, we're going to take this week in and week out. Because I want us to be reminded over and over and over, tangibly, physically, together, because so far, most of this service has been not participating, it's been watching, and that's fine, that's fine. But I want to add something to our service where we get to join together as a family. That we get to participate together. It's not just me talking and you listening. It's us together. Standing together at the feet of Jesus. Made right by what was broken. If you're at Crossroads, we take Believer's Communion. You don't have to be a member to take communion with us. Uh, just ask that you have placed your faith in Jesus because of what this represents and what it means. So here in just a moment, I'm going to pray, and then I'll invite you forward. When you come forward, uh, collect your elements, then head back to your seats and remain seated with your elements until everyone has had a chance to get them so we can take them together as a family. Would you join me in prayer? God, thank you so much. Thank you so much for the words of Paul to a church 4,000 years ago that are still just as relevant in this moment that we need you. We need your salvation. We need your faith. We need your grace. We need your body and your blood broken and spilled for us. Because without them, we are sinners who cannot be made right, who cannot earn our way, cannot do enough good actions or attend enough services or say enough prayers to be made right with you. But God, it seems too easy to me, too often. It's just believing and trusting you at your word. You said, this is the path to salvation. God, I pray that we trust you this morning. God, I reminded the man, I said, I told him, I believe all things are possible for those who believe. And his answer was, Lord, I believe, help me in my unbelief. God, may that be our heart this morning. 
God, if we are struggling in faith or lacking in faith, I pray this morning that you bolster that and build that in each and every one of us. And God, if there's anyone here who has not experienced that faith and placed their faith in you to receive the salvation, may this morning be that morning. God, as we set our hearts to take communion, I pray that we never minimize what we're doing. It's always this amazing moment. So God, thank you for your word. Bless our communion time. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You guys will stand and come and collect your elements. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he sat with his friends. That's what he called them. He sat with his friends. And they shared the Passover meal. They didn't quite understand all that that meant. But they shared the Passover meal. And at the end, he took bread. And after blessing it, he broke it. And he said, this in my body, which is broken for you. By his lashes, he was healed. His body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me when you do so now. In the same way, he took a cup. He said, this is my blood. The blood of the new covenant that is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. 
through this blood that we were made like. Never forget that blood. So drink this in remembrance of me. Thank you so much. God, thank you for your grace and your mercy. Thank you for your righteousness and counting it to us, declaring us right with you. And this morning I pray that we always humble people, recognize that the gifts are given freely, but also that we're never, we don't think of ourselves as smaller because we're right with you. We are sons of the Most High God. So God, the grace that you extend to us, the forgiveness that you extend to us, the love that you extend to us, may we consistently extend that to those around us. God, as we go this morning, may we go in faith, believing you at your word. Help us to love you more and love others better. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. This morning, if you need prayer for anything, we have prayer stations on each side of the room, or I'll be up here um, to pray with you or to talk with you, um, anything that you might need. Guys, I love you. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. I pray that you are blessed. Remember, next Sunday, we will not be here, 1030 at the gathering place uh, to celebrate 20 years of Crossroads. Again, thank you so much for joining us. I love you. See you next week if I don't see you before. Go in the peace and grace of God. Love you.